thing going on. Can you hear me? There he goes. There it is. One more time, can we give the Lord just a little bit of praise? I want to uh, have you open your Bibles very quickly to Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40. So if you brought a Bible or if you have your phone, you can use that as well. I won't call you out for saying, hey, you're on your phone. Uh, if you're looking at your Bible, don't watch the Olympics. You're looking at the, uh, you're watching, you're looking at the Word here. So do that. Pull out Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to start in verse 1 and going to work our way to 11, all right? Then I'm going to give you a few points here and there. Um, but today's Word, and we're starting this, uh, a little mini-series in the next four weeks on comfort. Everybody say the word comfort. Comfort. We all need it. Um, it, it's, it's available, and the word comfort is really what we're going to examine today on what it means to be comforted by the Lord, not only comforted by the Lord, but by comforted by others who know the Lord as well. So that's where we're going to go, and sometimes we need that. And, and where do we find comfort when life is overwhelming? And I, I know that in this room, of these, the people in this room, I can tell you we've all faced life that could be overwhelming. Would you agree? I had some overwhelming moments this week, right? I got called in to an, an emergency, and I love how they use the word emergency. I had gone to the dentist a, a week ago, and then I get called in with an, an emergency root canal. Why you, oh, oh, okay, I don't know why y'all did that. Apparently you know what that means. I don't know what that means. I heard the word emergency, you need to come in, we need to take care of this. And it wasn't from the dentist. It, apparently nowadays you go to a dentist and they send you to another dentist. Oh, we don't do that here. You got to go there. And then you get there and they go, yeah, we don't do that here. You got to go there. So you know, eventually they call me and they say, hey, here's the thing. We got to do this. So for two and a half hours, these people were doing this in my mouth. It, oh, yeah, thank you. It was very overwhelming. The overwhelmingness of it was this. It was the out of control, right? I had the gas and this happened. I didn't even share this with you yet. This happened. So I'm laying there. I got the, no, remember, I got the gas going, all right? So just imagine me on gas. Okay, so they got the gas going. <clears throat> they got this thing in my mouth, and they're going to work. And, and all of a sudden, this is, the, I, I'm, I'm hearing all the things. I'm hearing that if there's any dentist in here, you know what I'm talking about. I'm hearing this, uh, P75. Okay, okay. You know, they're, they're talking back and forth, the two people that are in there. Hey, P17, P19, they're just asking, for, and he's saying numbers, and I'm just sitting there going, I don't know what these things are. And then out of nowhere, after all this, P this, P that, or X this, X that, I don't know what they're saying, I hear this, oops. That's the last thing you want to hear while a dentist is into your mouth. I hear oops. And then I hear the lady who's on this side, and I got my eyes closed. Did I mention I was on the gas? Oh, I was on the gas. I hear oops, and then I'm going, okay, I feel a little overwhelmness happening here, all right? I feel a little something happening, and, and I said, oops. And then she goes, oh, no. <laughs> what do you do in that situation? You're, you're, I mean, I can't just go, okay, I'm out of here. Sorry, guys, we'll start this another time. And so my mind goes to all these places, right? Because that's where you go. When you hear an oops, oh, no. You know, I'm like, something just happened, right? And I heard like the tray, there's like a tray there, and I heard the tray thing kind of shake. One thing that popped right into my mind, the dentist just passed out. That's what I thought. I go, he saw something in here that he's never seen before, and he's laying on the ground. That's what I'm thinking. Then I thought, well, that's not happening because I can hear his voice. And then all of a sudden, I'm thinking, because I hear all this racket, I think that he must have been using something, and he dropped it on the floor because I heard something go down. And so my mind goes to, that dude just scooped it up and kept on working. So that's where my mind was. I'm going, I did not hear him run some water over this. I did not hear any water. I just heard, oops, oh no, pick something up. And this dude just said, 10 second rule in the dentist's office, it's all right. And the entire two and a half hours, I'm going, what just happened? There was this overwhelming feeling of being out of control. And that's what happens. And that's where we're going to talk today about life. 
Because sometimes in life, we have this overwhelming sensation in life that we're out of control and we're going, where do we lead? Where do we look? Where do we seek? How do we find it? And that's what we're going to look at today on using the word comfort in Isaiah chapter 40. Because how do we handle the news that you've been laid off? How do you handle when you know that your marriage is becoming unraveled? How do you handle when you get that diagnosis that you are not ready for it? hey, you have this or you have that and these things are going on in your life and all the, the, the future, you don't know what it looks like or your children are living in rebellion or you, or you fight this depression and loneliness and you have fearfulness and you have anxious and, you, and you're anxious and you have anxiety. And so where do you turn? So the world says that you got to turn to worldly things. See, the world says how you fight those things that all fall apart on you is you got to go do this and this and this and read this book and that book and this book and all that. No, 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 no. You find it here. And this is the only place you're going to find it. I'm sorry. Oprah is not going to fix you. Jesus is going to fix it. He's going to comfort you. So listen, today as we, we talk about this, uh, Isaiah's original re readers here, they're going through it. So, so just in context, so you understand, Isaiah, the original readers of this, and who he's writing to is these people who are going into Babylonian captivity due to their own covenant, uh, their own covenant unfaithfulness. Okay, they did this to themselves, and they know they did it to themselves, and they know these things are about to happen. They struggle to maintain the godly character in the midst of an ungodly world. I'm going to say that again. They struggle to maintain a godly character in an ungodly world. Do you feel some similarities? I think there's a very much similarities that we have even today. I don't believe this is much of a godly world we're living in. And how do we maintain that godly character? How do we find that comfort that God wants to ha has to have? So... We got to look back in context for this verse before I go to the verse. Um, and you can flip over if you want in chapter 39. In chapter 39, 5 and 7, it says this. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house, that which your fathers have stored up to this day, all the things your father has worked for, all the things that your dads have, your, your ancestors have built all those things now have been stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Because of your unfaithfulness, because of you doing the things that you were doing, because of the things that you, you chose to do, you are now going to go into Babylonian captivity. And so he says, basically, you know, get ready. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. See, the first, um, Isaiah 40 kind of marks a turning point in the Bible. And in, in, in especially in this book of Isaiah. For the first 39 chapters, we see that there is judgment after judgment after judgment after judgment after judgment until boom, chapter 40, where he comes in with, now let me comfort you. And so that's what we're going to talk about is more the comfort of the Lord. All right. These people, they knew they deserved where they were. But they're asking this question, is God going to ever hear our prayer? And I don't know if you've ever asked that question or not. Is God going to hear my prayer? Does God hear what I'm asking him? Especially when you're going through trials, especially when you're going through tribulations, especially when you're going through things that just happen like we've talked about. So Isaiah chapter 40, uh, God desires his people to have comfort. So if you have your Bibles, it's, it is a, kind of a long, 1 through 11. I'm going to read through it and then we're going to break it down. And I got about 38 points I'm going to give you today. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Verse 2 says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. Jerusalem is the people. That her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Verse 3 says, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths uh, make a straight path in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. 
And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the flesh shall see it together. For the mouth uh, of the Lord has spoken. Verse 6 says, a voice now cries and says, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like flower of a field. Verse 7, the grass withers, the flower fades, and when the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God will stand forever. Verse 9 says, it goes on, it says, Go on up to the high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might. His arms rule with him. Behold his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. See, Isaiah 41 through 11 is a powerful passage that offers comfort. It offers hope and a promise of redemption. So, Lord, I pray that you take this passage right now as we walk through it, as we break it down and speak to each and every one of us in this room, God. We thank you for your love in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's point number one out of 40. Point number one, the comfort of the Lord provides strength. Listen to this one. So the comfort of the Lord provides strength. And so when we're seeking that comfort through that trial, we're seeking those things. And remember what it says in verse one, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, the people. Biblical definition of comfort is this, a deep and profound sense of peace. It's a sense of uh, assurance. It's a sense of encouragement that comes from God, grounded in his presence. It's, it's what it is, is it's him walking through whatever trial, whatever situation, whatever circumstance it is, he's walking through it with us. It is a sustaining force that enables believers to endure trials. It enables believers to in, in, endure the, the hurts and the pains uh, of life. I know you've heard me say this a billion zillion times and I'm gonna keep on saying it. You're either going into a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or you're living in a storm right now. That's life. Until the day you die. You're either going into one, you're coming out of one, or you're living in one. And there are people in this room I know that you feel like you've probably been in that storm most of your life. God can offer you comfort today. Don't miss his comfort today. The Bible also says the word comfort here in the Bible can mean come alongside, come along. Come along someone or he comes alongside of us. And to help in times of need, it also means to soothe or console or to reinsure. It can also mean to provide, again, like I said with the, with the opening here, it provides strength. It, it gives us support in times of trouble, in times of danger, a, a difficulty. The Bible promises that God will comfort people in their troubles, such as physical suffering, such as loss of a loved one, or even our poor decisions. And I, I, I have to say this because sometimes we create our own storm and then we want to cry when it rains. But God can still comfort us even in our poor decisions. Because we see in these people in Isaiah here, this audience that Isaiah is writing to, they cause their exile to Babylon. But God is comforting them. So sometimes we fall. Sometimes we make mistakes. We are born sinners. We're going to sin. It also says that we should also comfort others in the word by being involved with people's lives. This is why life groups are so important to me is when others have problems, you walk alongside them providing comfort as God has comforted us. This is what I love so much about our church. Our church, if someone falls, we have people there to pick you up. Do you understand that? I, I want you to hear this about our church. Is when something happens in your life and you're part of this church, you're part of a life group, and we know what's happening in your world and your life, you will find people there to help you. We just witnessed that yesterday, as you know, we, uh, maybe some of you know, some of you don't know, but uh, uh, my man Paul, who we prayed for multiple times, he went to be with the Lord July 12th. And yesterday we had a celebration of life for him in this room. 
And what's so remarkable to me is just the people that were here, the people that knew him, and the people that rallied around a family because he was in the hospital for a couple months. And I watched so many people from this church say, we got you. We're going to walk with you through this, through this storm. And I want everyone in this room to know, whatever storm may happen to you, you will have us and you will have this church walk with you, walk alongside you in that comfort. Look, this verse right here came to my mind when I was kind of just putting this all together, and it's one of my favorite ones. And it's 2 Corinthians 1, 4 through 6. It says, he comforts us as all our trouble. He comforts us in all of our trouble so that, can, so that we can comfort others. Listen to this again. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can then now comfort others. When they are troubled, we, we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will show us with his comfort through Christ. Even when we are weighed down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. What this says to me is that God comes alongside of us when we go through hard times and he comforts us. And then before you know it, before you even know it, he brings someone alongside you for you to comfort them as the Lord has comforted you. Isn't that amazing? This is why I share my story like I do. This is why I talk about being in a plane crash for those of you that have been in plane crashes and wondering what to do about it. How many? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's why I, why I share my stories because I know that if you hear that story that some of you will say, hey, listen, I know and I understand that. That's why when we do our baptisms, we share these stories of life change and, and how life has changed. Though that person can, you know, have you ever sat somewhere in your life with something going on and thought you were the only one going through it? It's amazing how many times that, we, you know, you, you can have that. And this is why we have what we have coming up. And I want you to know about this. Uh, and if you have the graphic, throw it up there. But it's grief, share, divorce, care, and surrendering the secret. We're offering these three things. Grief, share. You've lost somebody in your life. And you're saying, I don't know what to do with this. And I need to be comforted not only by the Lord, but by the others who have lost people. We have grief share coming up, and it's starting very soon, and the date's up there. You can see it uh, at 6.15 on Wednesday. And it's so you can sit in a room with others who have lost people themselves and with someone who's lost somebody who is telling you how they got through it so you'll be able to get through it as well, walking alongside you as things fall apart. We also then have divorce care. Divorce care is the same thing. It's like a loss and you don't know what to do with it and you're trying to go through it and you're trying to deal with it and you're trying to figure it out. Well, there's people who have gone through it because when you said I do, you probably didn't think it was going to come to I don't. And you're able to sit with people who've gone through that hardship and gone through that hurt and gone through that pain and they will walk alongside you to comfort you in that. That's divorce care. And again, this year, we're offering this. We're offering surrendering the secret. And surrendering the secret is the tough one. And this is the one where a lot of people uh, struggle with. And maybe it's not you in this room today. And maybe it's somebody you know. But surrendering the secret is this. It's dealing with people in their lives at some point who have gone through abortion. There's an incredible thing after an abortion that happens with guilt and shame and hurt. There's a lot that goes on in that. And those are things that just can sit inside you for a very long time and grow and grow and grow until you can sit with some people and talk through it and work through it. And these are comforting things. And this is why we offer these things in this church. So not only will you have the Lord comfort you, you will then be able to have others comfort you as well. But so if you're interested in any three of these, go to our website, go to the, pl the platform points, and you can QR code it. You can sign up for it and be a part of it. It's coming up quickly. And if you want to be a part of this, please jump in. So God is speaking words of comfort to his people in this text. Assuring them that the hard service is over and their sin has been paid for. So he's letting them know that. God offers that comfort even for us today. Reminding us of his love. Reminding us of his forgiveness. 
reminding us that he loves us. The comfort of God offers, and I want you to hear this, the comfort God offers is not without, you, from persecution. Let me put it that way. I'm trying to say this the right way. Just because you say I'm going all in with God doesn't mean all your problems go away. It does not mean that. You've heard me share this one before. I mean, the day I got saved was one of the most amazing days of my life. I went off and I moved in with my father and all crazy stuff was happening around me and someone invited me to church and I did not want to go to church. I didn't believe in God. I wanted nothing to do with God. And if there was a God, I was mad at him. The fact that my father was an alcoholic drug addict and I didn't want anything to do with him because he was beating on me every day. And all of a sudden, someone invited me to church a thousand times. I finally showed up. I go into that place and I have this encounter with God that just, just wrecked my heart like nobody's business. And it was the most incredible thing to ever happen in my life when he came into my life and I realized that I was loved by someone and that someone cared for me, that someone loved me, that someone gave their life for me, that someone said, I'm going to do die for you. Something I've never heard in my entire life that someone would die for me so I can have a place in heaven when my heart stops. That blew my mind. And I said, I want that. And the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of my heart and just brought me to that place of coming no to the Lord. Yes, I had ups and downs after that. But here's what the thing is, and I say this all the time, I got saved that night on a Wednesday and I stayed at my friend's house that night and I went home back to the house I was living at in Benton, Louisiana on, two, on, on Thursday. Guess what? My dad was still drunk. He didn't sober up. Not only was he still drunk, he beat on me that night. Beat on me, chased me out the house with a gun, told me I was worthless, I was nothing, I'd never amount to anything, I was better off dead because I was a mistake. That happened the night after I got saved. And I ran out the house and I hid behind a tree, a tree that I always hid behind it. And for the first time in my life, the first time in my life, I found comfort because of the night before. Oh no, my problems didn't go away. Dad didn't sober up, it's still tough. But I hid behind that tree. He's stomping around looking for me. And I had comfort. And that comfort came from Jesus. That comfort comes from the Lord. So just because you come to know the Lord and just because you, you, you go all out doesn't mean that you won't have trials. It doesn't mean that you won't have these things that happen in our life. And the, and the people, the original audience here, they understood this because, I mean, you look at this. Daniel was the most faithful guy you can ever imagine. And he was in exile for 70 years. And he was faithful. Comfort doesn't mean cushy. Comfort doesn't mean feel good. Comfort, you know, uh, is this. It provides endurance to get through the difficult times. That's what it means. Number two out of 40. Here we go. I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm only kidding. Preparing the way for God's presence, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths in the desert, a highway for our God, Isaiah 43 through 5. This passage points to the coming of the Lord and the need to prepare for his arrival. Uh, ultimately fulfilling uh, that was John the Baptist. He came, he prepared the way. And we can, we can also begin to prepare our hearts and our lives for God's presence. Even today, even right now, you can start asking God to speak to you. Even now, you can ask God to start comforting you. Even now, today, you can ask that. And it's through repentance. It's through readiness. We should always have a heart that is ready to hear from the Lord. Always. Number three is this. God's word remains true and relevant through all ages. Hear this one. God's word remains relevant and true forever. Let me give you the definition forever. Forever. Not ending. He says the grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of God endures forever. Isaiah 40 verse 8. Life is, life is temporary. We can't guarantee tomorrow. You can't guarantee walking out of these doors that you're going to be here tomorrow. That's not a scare tactic. That's reality. That's life. We cannot guarantee we're going to be here tomorrow. Life is temporary. But God's word is eternal. 
God's word will never end. God's word is forever. Trust in God, unchanging promises, and build our lives on his word. That's what we need to do to find comfort. But there are things that we think of, right? You know, once, once thought to be permanent, but then fades. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. That one t-shirt you thought you would have forever. Golden boy. You thought was the most amazing shirt. And then one day it just doesn't fit anymore. It just doesn't have the same color. It fades. So there's things in life we think of that's going to be forever. Our hair. Uh, oh, sorry. Our hair color. How about this one? This one really, what Vicky and I talked about. Because here's where I am right now at 50 something years old. You may not know this, but one time in my life, I was an athlete. <laughs> Boy, I tell you what, I can dunk on people like it was nobody's business. I, I can shoot from, well, close, but I, I, I would shoot. I could run, I could jump, I could do these things, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you can't. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah, right? It's just that moment where you go, man, watch this, boy. And I got 19 and a 22-year-old, so I'm like, y'all, watch this. <laughs> and they're like, okay, cool, dad, don't hurt yourself. You know, <laughs> I'm three back surgeries in. And an emergency root canal. I don't know what that is. Those things fade. But look at this. Isaiah 46 through 8 reminds us that while our lives and our achievements and our athleticism fleets, fades, falls away as flowers, but the word of God endures forever. That's so good. That's encouraging to me. Even though my body's failing, his word will never fail. The last one is this, and I'll ask you to come out and play real soft is this. Comfort comes from knowing Jesus. It's bottom line. Hear this. Simple as one. If this is the only one you hear today, comfort comes from knowing Jesus. Comfort comes from having a relationship with Christ. It says, you who bring good news to Zion, go up on the high mountain. Here is your God, Isaiah 49. In, in, in NLT, I love it. It says, oh, Zion, talking about his people, messenger of good news. Good news is that there is a Messiah. Good news is that there is a Savior. Good news is that, you know what, if our heart stops and we die and we know Jesus, we have a place in heaven. That's called good news. And there's good news, he says. He says, O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintop. Shout it loud, O Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem being the people here. Shout and do not be afraid, it says. Tell the towns of Judah your God is coming. Tell the towns we live in right now that your God is coming. We need to go out through those doors and we need to let people know that God is coming. He says it right here. Your God is coming. In verse 10 it says, yes, the sovereign Lord is coming. He's coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. God's power and his care are evident. He comes with might, but also tends his flock like a shepherd. There's a balance here of God's strength and his tenderness. There's this balance a balance of encouragement to share the good news of God's love and care with others. But there's this, like I said, there's this balance, this dual roles of a shepherd who both protects gently and he cares for the sheep. God's relationship with us should comfort us. Comfort is rooted in God's presence. In Psalms 23, it says, even though I walk through what? through the darkest valley, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of, I will, f what? I will, what? Fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
So God now is saying, with a rod and a staff, I'm going to comfort you. Let me explain this. There is a rod that leads you, that guides you. There's a rod that the shepherd would use to go, no, 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 you go this direction. Oh, no, 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 don't walk into that direction. No, 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 let me keep you out of that direction. And there's also a rod that says, I will protect you from the enemy. I will protect you from harm. I will protect you from those things. So, so there's a rod and a staff that should comfort us every single day. Amen. The assurance that God is with us, even in the darkest times, brings deep comfort. God's promises are a source of comfort. And it should remind believers that their trials are temporary. That God has a good plan for their future. Romans 8 even says all things work for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. The promise of comfort in believers is with knowledge that God is in control and working all things out. Finally, biblical comfort puts, points us to eternal hope. Let me say it again. Biblical comfort points us to eternal hope we have in Jesus. Eternal hope that we have in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 says, speaks of the comfort that comes from the hope of the resurrection and the return of Christ. Knowing that our ultimate future is secure in Jesus brings comfort in the face of earthly trials and earthly sufferings. My question to you this morning, are we resting in that? Are you resting in your life right now with, your, with, with understanding that God, knowing and having a relationship with him, comforts you? If you've been trying to find comfort in all these other places, you're not going to find it, or you might find it temporarily. I'm not saying that the drugs, the alcohol, those things won't give you comfort in that moment. But guess what? You sober up. Guess what? You come down. Guess what? Those things will leave you. But when you come, become a relationship with Jesus, he will comfort you forever. Even in the hard times. But it has to start with this. And I got two couple things and we're done. And we'll sing one more song. I asked him to do this song, just rest on us. And I'm asking God to rest on us today. To rest in our hearts today. But I have to ask this question. I can't go through this message. I can't talk about how awesome and amazing our God is. I can't tell you how incredible he is and what he does in our lives without letting you look into your life and look into your heart and ask yourself a very real question. And that question is, do you know the Lord? I'm not asking you if you know about God. I'm not asking if you know a, about Jesus. I'm not asking you if you've, you know, been to church before. I'm not asking if you've been dipped, dunked, sprinkled. I'm not asking you if you bought a Christian t-shirt. I'm not asking you this morning if, if you said, I mean, I've checked off a box that I went to church this many times. That's not what I'm asking you this morning. What I'm asking you this morning is would you look into your heart and ask yourself a very real question, and that is this. If your heart stops and you die and it's all over for you, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? We just celebrated two incredible stories right there. So the question has to be in your heart, in your life right now, do you know the Lord? And I love what Miguel said to me. He was talking to me about last time when I gave a, I gave a call for some spontaneous baptism. And he said he sat there and he felt like the, 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 his heart was just pounding in his chest. And he didn't move because he knew he needed to go do it. But eventually he obeyed the Lord. And I know sometimes you sit there and I say it that way and I'm passionate about it. But you know why I'm passionate about it? Because it's real. Do you know why I speak it the way I'm speaking it? Because it's real. I get to wake up every day no matter what. No matter what situation, no matter what circumstance, no matter what. I can wake up every single day and know that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And when my heart stops and it's done, it's over, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. I didn't plan on sharing this. I'm going to share this. One of the coolest comfort moments in my life, as you know, I was in a plane crash. During this plane crash, 
and I've shared this before, but man, it was so comforting. During this plane crash, we, we, we were in the cockpit. My grandfather's flying, my grandmother's in the side seat, and the engine catches on fire. Everything starts falling apart. It's just unbelievable. I can't even explain it. The noise, the sound, the, the, I mean, the, the shaking, the, the, just the, the fire, the, the smoke coming through the cockpit, the, the radio going off, my grandfather yelling into the radio, mayday, 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 and saying, that, I mean, I can so remember this, and I was only seven years old, and I'm sitting in the back seat completely and totally panicked. Who wouldn't be? Even at that age, I knew this wasn't a normal flight. And while we're shaking and while everything is going crazy, my grandfather, who like this father figure in my life, he turns around and I'll never forget this day and I see his face and it's only really the face that I know of my grandfather. It's the only one I can really remember is in that plane. He even had the things on his head. He had the microphone in his face and he turns around and he basically looks like as he's trying to navigate a plane that's going down. This man turns around and looks me in the eyes and he said to me by name, he said, Casey, and I look at my grandfather and he says, you're going to be okay. I don't know if he believed that or not. But in that moment, he gave me comfort. In that moment, this father figure looks me in the face and says, Casey, by my name, you're going to be okay. And I remember being in this cockpit that was just shaking uncontrollably. It's going nuts. Everything's falling apart. I know we're going down. I don't know if I'm going to live or die. I don't know if those two are going to die or live. But in that moment, when he looked me in the face and says, you're going to be okay, everything stopped. The shaking stopped. The vibration stopped. The smell of the fuel and the smoke, it stopped. I know that sounds crazy. Oh, but it stopped. And then in an instant, we hit the ground. We went through the trees. My grandfather's head hit a tree, broke his neck. He later died. My grandmother's Seatbelt almost cut her in half. She survived, lived to be 93. Some of you, I believe this morning, I guess that's why God just said, hey, you need to share this. Is there some of you right now, you're in that cockpit. There are some of you right now, you're sitting in the back seat and you need the God of gods. You need the Alpha, the Omega. You need the King of Kings the Lord of Lords, to turn around and look you in the face and call you by name and say, you're going to be okay. So I ask this question first, and then we're going to pray for those who know the Lord. But I can't sit here and tell you how amazing he is without giving you an opportunity to ask him into your life, to begin that relationship with him. Would you do me a favor? Would you close your eyes and be real still? No one's looking around. This ain't ever about people around you. Uh, it's not even about me. It's just me asking you to right here, right now, look into your heart. Right here, right now, let me look, you look into your heart. And I'm praying. And if you know the Lord in this room, if you have a relationship with Jesus in this room, would you begin to pray that if there's anybody in this place this morning that doesn't know him, that the Holy Spirit will move in their heart right now? Because I'm going to ask you this question. Do you know him? Not about him. Can you honestly say you have a relationship with him? Has he changed you? The Bible very clearly says when you accept the Lord, the old is gone, the new has come. You become a brand new creation, a brand new creature. You're new. You're changed. Has he changed you? I got to know. If you're sitting here and that heart's pounding in your chest right now, I'm hoping and praying that's the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. This is not a magic prayer. 
This is a prayer of repentance. This is a prayer of belief. The Bible says you confess with your mouth, but you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ loved you. He died for you. He was buried for you. He then proved that he was God and he came back for you. And again, he's coming back for us. So if that's you this morning, you're saying, that's what I need more than anything else in this room. I know the only thing that's going to comfort me is Jesus, and I don't have Jesus. I want to invite you to have Jesus. Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I need you. I can't do this alone. I believe in my heart that you are real. I believe in my heart that you love me. I believe in my heart that you died for me. And I believe that you're coming back for me. So Lord, forgive me of my mess ups, my mistakes. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my heart. Rescue me. Rescue me. Change me. I'm ready to follow you, Jesus. I'm ready. Thank you, God. With no one looking around. If you truly prayed that prayer this morning and you know that it was real, you know that God spoke to your heart this morning, would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Anybody in this place, unafraid, unashamed, would you just say, hey, look, that was me this morning. I I asked God to come into my life to save me, to rescue me. I'm asking you to raise your hand unashamed, unafraid. This ain't about anybody else. This is not about people around you either. This is about you right here, right now. Anybody else, did you pray that prayer this morning? I see a hand there. And Ed will take care of you guys back there raising your hand. If you prayed that prayer and your hand's up, and I'm just going to ask you to look up at me. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm just going to ask you to look up at me. Do you mean that, my man? Do you mean that 100% today? That you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life? Then let me tell you, your life's going to change forever. I'm not going to ask you to come forward because I know that's weird and all that may be for you, but I want you to find me later or have a conversation with me later so you and I can talk, okay? about what that relationship looks like. And anybody else in here that I might have missed your hand or I might have didn't see you, please find me and say, yes, I gave my life to the Lord. What's next? Well, what's next is baptism. So here, that's my next question. How many in this room can say, I know the Lord, I have a relationship with the Lord, but I have been putting off and putting off and putting off baptism over and over and over, and I know I need it in my life. Would you raise your hand and say, that's me? Anybody in this room? says, I put it off too much. I am struggling, seeing. Well, if you have your hand up, I can't see it. But if that's something that's pressing on your heart, then I'm going to ask you to find me again. Fill out a card. Let's have a conversation of what baptism looks like. So, Lord Jesus, we love you.